So welcome, Emil Shivji, director of Tug of War, um, your world premiere screenings here at TIFF. We are so uh, grateful and excited to have you here, especially with your Toronto connections that I hope to get into a little bit later. But um, please, uh, please tell us, take us through this journey that you went on with Adam Shafi's book um, and the making of this film. I mean, thank you so much, first of all, for having this film and having me at the festival. Um, Toronto does have a very deep place in my heart um, for many reasons. I'm sure we'll go over them. But I think, you know, this film has been such a long journey. I read the novel when I was 16 years old in high school. It's mandatory Swahili literature that has to be, uh, it's part of the curriculum, actually. And, you know, as generations have gone by, reading and literature and novels and Generally, the whole industry of books has gone down the drain. People don't give it enough attention. So I remember being in that space where people were not reading the book. And I gave it a shot. I loved reading. It's what got me into writing. And I fell in love with the characters. I fell in love with Shafi's writing, how he portrayed Zanzibar, how he portrayed a time that we don't hear about enough, the 1950s. So I mean, obviously, this I was 16. I didn't think about it too much. But then when I was working on another script a couple of years ago called T-Junction, I was really struggling with moving the story forward. And every draft I would write would reach around 60 pages and I would feel like there's an entire act missing. Mm -hmm. So I explained the story to my neighbor, who's a tuition teacher. And she said, oh, have you read Shafi's Vuta Nigo Vute, Tug of War? I said, yeah, yeah, I read it, but such a long time ago. I said, oh, maybe it might help you. There's certain elements that are similar. And only now in like, uh, hindsight, I can imagine how much influence this novel has had on me because a lot of the stories I've written have had similar tropes as the novel. So I went and bought the book and I reread it and I picked up page one and 277 pages later and I put the book down and I just fell in love with the characters all over again and the space. And Zanzibar has a very close place in my heart as well. My family is originally from there and I, since a child I go there all the time. So I knew that this was a film that I wanted to make, or this story I wanted to see on the big screen. And that's when the journey started. We optioned the book in 2016. I felt comfortable enough to uh, buy the rights uh, two years later, raise a little bit of money to do a, uh, a proof of concept, which I thought was, you know, this start small, never worked with a big budget film. And this, I've always produced, written, directed myself. So I want to start small with the proof of concepts. So that was the idea in 2018. But then, funnily enough, I met Stephen, Stephen Markovitz, uh, who I'd known from before, a couple of years ago. But I met him in Zanzibar. And I told him about the story and what I was doing. And he seemed very interested and very keen. And this was just before Rafiki, I think. Or was it just after Rafiki had come out? So he was, yeah, felt, yeah I felt quite attached to the region. Yeah. And uh, he told me, look, I'll give you six months, you know, go ahead, write the script, do the development work, uh, send me drafts, I'd love to read them. And if we feel confident to move forward, then we will. So that's when the research started. And I just moved to Zanzibar, I lived there for two years, I was researching, and going to every resource I could find, whether living or dead, you know, just find information about the 1950s. And six months later, Stephen read a draft and was very happy with it, although it required work. And uh, we decided to work together. And that was when the real pre-production began. Beautiful, beautiful. Tell, tell, tell us about um, what you were committed to showing through the film um, that had really kind of captured you in the book, in the story, in the history. You know, it was difficult at the beginning to really figure out what story I wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. There's so much to say. You know, you have an opportunity to work with an experienced producer to raise a significant amount of finance for a local film, for a Tanzanian film. And also just to get the trust and the respect and the collaboration from fellow artists and, you know, uh, such talented writers like Adam Shafi, to say, yeah, here's my novel, go ahead, I'd love for you to make the film. So there was a lot of pressure. There was a lot of pressure initially. I didn't know which story to tell because initially I thought, okay, I'll just do an adaptation. Take the novel, it's amazing. Who am I to go change Shafi's miraculous work, you know? And I'll just use my skill as a filmmaker to translate from word to screen. 
But the more time I spent in Zanzibar and the more research I did, I realized that this gap that I felt, this void that I felt that I wanted to talk about, so did everyone else, including the people I talked to, including the elderly Zanzibari population that was alive in the 1950s and witnessed 1964, which was during the revolution. Uh, a lot of people died, people were massacred, a lot of lives were lost, families were broken, and we've never really talked about that period. So when I would want to talk about the 50s, a couple of people would either turn away or say, no, I don't want to talk about the 50s. I want to talk about 1964. And you give the person that space, that opportunity to have the discussion. So that's what I wanted to do. And the more I spent time in Zanzibar, living there, getting the trust of the people, becoming part of the community, the more I realized that there was much more in addition to Shafi's novel that had to be told in this film. And I think that's really where I try to find this balancing act between the love story in Shafi and the political story in Zanzibar. And that's been kind of the struggle throughout the process. I don't know if I've done justice to it, but we'll find out. I guess so. Oh, I mean, I would say so, but perhaps I'm biased. I don't know. <laughs> um, so, I mean, how, when I was watching, it was really clear to me that Zanzibar was a very clear character was a was a was the primary character if I if I want to say that and I and I think that's also because I've been there and I I have felt that space and I know um, that I felt you capture it on screen I wonder if you can talk about the pacing and the color and the score and the other aesthetic choices that you made I keep calling your time structure wave like because it feels that way to me. But please, yeah, tell us how you made those choices. Well, I'm really glad you think of it that way <laughs> because that was very conscious on my part. Um, you know, while I was there and I was trying to figure out what story I wanted to tell, I also made a very conscious decision. And I did this very early on, even before the writing, which was I did not want to make a film set in the past. I didn't want to make a film that we feel like we can watch and, and, and look at it and say, that's how it happened. Because I don't have the right to do that. I don't think anyone has the right to do that about Zanzibar right now, except the Zanzibari people themselves, who are even struggling with their own past. The trauma, the intergenerational trauma, the, the massacre that happened. How, just making a film is not gonna solve the problem. And I don't even think it's just, it's, it's enough to be called a gateway. I think it's part, a building block of part of many things that need to happen, right? I don't want to romanticize what I'm trying to do at all. So then I realized that I want to make a contemporary film, a film that people can watch and relate to in the current political climate, in the current racial climate, in the current just general ecosystem of Zanzibar that's identified as a touristic destination with the white beaches and the timeless infrastructure. But they're moving people. They're living people, breathing people who have constant struggles, who are in constant conflict, and are the underdog, whether it's in the union relationship between the mainland and the island, or as people who are missing ability, who, who don't have a chance to really speak to their own history. So I wanted to make a very contemporary film. And for me, this meant Zanzibar coming to life. And how do you do that? I knew I had two protagonists, uh, Denke and Yasmin, the male and the female, but for me, Zanzibar was a third character, like the way you, you, you say it. And every scene, every, every character conflict that I wrote into the story, I needed Zanzibar to have a say. It wasn't a backdrop for me. You know, I could have, this, this film could have been made anywhere in the world. It's really not that, but that unique of a story, which you're talking about in the 1950s and the 60s. It's a love story, it's a political That was across the world. What was Zanzibari about? And Zanzibar is the answer. The space itself was a site of struggle. The, the island catered towards a sense of liberation. You could taste it in the air. And this is what I got from the interviews, from the research I did. A hundred newspapers used to come out every week in different, four different languages. This is Zanzibar Island. You can't capture all of this in a 92 minute film. But if I could, if I could make Zanzibar character, one that you can fall in love with, one that you can fight for, 
then that sense of believing in an island, believing in a country at the time, to have independence, to have liberation as a character, then at least I feel like I've pushed the bar a little bit in terms of the discourse around the island. Yeah, yeah. Talk to us about the, the like, the real um, ingrained film history in Zanzibar that has really been, I think, um, championed by ZIF, the Zanzibar International Film Festival. I was there that year that you met Steven and I met yes. you and he introduced me to you um, and now we're here. Um, mm -hmm. I, I remember um, in sitting in the old fort in the open air cinema and just being, listening to, to Swahili, listening to Ki Swahili um, with Swahili people, like in, I just, it was an experience of cinema I've never had um, and I have never had again since. Um, and it felt organic and it felt like something rich and, and long preceding me. Can you talk about how that played a part in this filmmaking for you? Well, every film I've made, I have this notorious habit of moving to the place, the location where I want to shoot, getting, becoming part of the community in every honest way possible. And if you're rejected, you're rejected, but luckily that's never happened. Um, and, and really, in, in a sense, not just to make producing the film easier, because it does, obviously, once you're part of the community, but more in a sense to really have the, the integrity to the story. How do you become part of a story? How do you tell a story if you're not living it, right? Now in Zanzibar, although you know it's been there for many years, I've been going there since I was a child, the reason why I moved there was because there is this very tangible, organic culture of the Swahili people that you can only truly experience once you're immersed in it. And not over a weekend or not over a week or going to the north where the tourists go for the beaches, but actually the, the, the hearing conversations through walls of your neighbors, hearing, you know, who did what and all the gossip through the streets. Like being part and parcel of that, it really makes you realize that obviously as much as Zanzibar is a beautiful place and it's a world heritage site, the people have moved on, they've developed, they're past that and they deserve stories to be told about what they're going through on a regular basis, their daily struggles. And I was, and that's why I, at one point I thought that this was the wrong story to tell. This was the wrong film to tell. Why do I want to talk about the past if they're not ready to talk about it themselves? But that's when I was confronted by elderly Zanzibar who says, no, we are way more than ready to talk about the story. We just need to find the right outlet. And the outlet is a communal one. And Ziff, where it happens, the amphitheater, it's, there, are no, like, there are no individual seats. It's this communal space, you're shoulder to shoulder, next to five, 600 people, and you're watching a film and literally experiencing it physically as the other person is. If they're laughing and shaking laughter, you're gonna shake in laughter as well because you're so close to them. Of course, this is a pre-COVID world, but you understand what I'm saying. And it's open air under the stars and the skies, even if and, you don't speak Kiswahili, you're laughing beside that. Exactly. It's such a communal experience. And that was my introduction to cinema, you know? And for me, this I've never thought of cinema as anything else. You know, when you watch it in these closed off rooms, uh, it's very awkward for me. I don't understand. Like, I feel a little bit suffocated. And I always look for the exit. And you always find me sitting outside and coming in a bit much later because I experience cinema very differently. It's always about, you know, I was trained in third cinema. It's what got me into filmmaking, the idea of the communal story and not just having a singular protagonist, but letting the space and the people and the masses speak to you through the through film. And for me, in our film, Mutanikobute, it was crucial that I had most of the people behind the camera and from the camera, Tanzanian, or at least from the region, Swahili speaking people because this is their story as well. This film would do very well in Mombasa. It would do very well in Lamu, ac across the coast, because it speaks to coastal culture. So we really fought very hard to have as many local crews as we did. And I can probably say at least 
96 or 97 percent were local crew yeah. for a film of this level so this it did mean a lot congratulations congratulations thank you um, I think to change, like to switch gears a little bit. I mean, you kind of you kind of led me here too in what you just said. Talk about the experience of going to film school in Toronto, which I think and and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this project was a part of your work here as well. What was it like um, working on this story for home from away from home? Um, <laughs> What was that like for you? Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it's a very good question because I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out, to be honest. Um, I did my undergrad at York University uh, in Toronto, uh, a degree in film. And my first year was very tough. You know, I never lived in a, such a cold country before. Um, the culture shock initially and you know, we, we, when I grew up going to high school, we didn't have courses in drama or in arts. I did chemistry, biology, math, English. So, you know, the basic core courses you do, science and arts, but not, the, not, not, not anything that could ever offer a career in the fine arts. So my first interaction with formal education in the arts was university level. And it's a very, it's a very small program in terms of the number of intake, the candidates they take in. So I'm looking around and everyone's already made a film before. You know, they know what they're doing. They're using Premiere Pro software and all these things. And, and, I'm, and, I, and my sister was in, in Montreal at the time and we had to get together, meet and, and budget, you know, enough money in order to buy a MacBook that I could start using. Because I was under this idea that you have to have this computer in order to make a film. That's how I started at a very, very novice level. Really, really novice. So it was hard at the beginning. I felt like uh, I was 10, 10 miles behind everybody else, you know? And it, it's quite competitive. I was on a full scholarship and had to maintain a 7.8 GPA every year to keep the scholarship. And as a disaster student without a scholarship, you can't really afford going to University of Canada. So there was a lot of pressure on, uh, on me when I was in Canada initially. But what it did, and this is where it gets, for me, the, the journey really took a different twist, was that it allowed me to really push hard to make a strong network. And the network that I built in the film community was one with a lot of people of color who had also just started out, based in Canada, but you know had similar experiences that I could talk to, and lectures, and people who worked in the equipment room. Uh, a lot of my close friends were those who worked in the equipment room. And they kind of showed me the ropes and helped me figure out how to find your way around Canada, you know, politically and also socially. And I think this really um, created a, a, a safe space for me. It really did in terms of the art scene and in terms of how I felt about myself being in a foreign country. So then I finished my undergrad, moved to Tanzania for five years, started lecturing at the university, and then went back to my master's. I already knew I wanted to make this film, but I was still under this proof of concept idea. So I went back to my master's with the idea that I would make the proof of concept as my thesis. And writing about Zanzibar while sitting in Toronto is the weirdest experience one can have. <laughs> you know, I'm used to writing in spaces where, you know, when, before we were even on this call, you thought there was a bird outside my window. You know, this, the sounds, and, the, and there was a bird outside my window. That's the best part. The, the, the sounds, the ambience, the, the people, the, the everyday life while you're on the continent, it feeds into what you write. Yeah. So locked up in this 24th floor apartment building in the middle of Toronto, trying to write about the sun and the waves just felt very contradictory. So it was a real struggle initially. So instead, what I did by was really be such a Have back and forth conversations with them, and I just started a lot of watching a lot of Latin American cinema or whatever I could get my hands onto through the library and the resources in Toronto. And then the first chance I got, which was during the strike, yeah, anyway, so it, it gave me an opportunity to move back to Zanzibar, and now I took what skills I learned in Toronto, which was really about finding inspiration 
in other work in other places in order to write for Zanzibar because mm. I had to be back in, on the island to be able to write about it. Yeah, I, I, I think that's so, so interesting and a lot of, um, I mean, Toronto and Canada is a place that um, has seen many, many migrations. And uh, I love that, that what you learned here was that you needed to be home and not, um, and not like Canada couldn't be a home, but that that uh, that there was an environmental kind of ecological imperative to yeah. to the work that you were doing, and that that couldn't be removed from the place that it was meant to be. Um, yeah. It's a beautiful it's a beautiful work, Emil. Uh, you should be so proud of yourself. Um, you. I'm sure Tanzania and Zanzibar are so proud of you. Thank you for bringing the film here again. Um, and uh, I can't wait to see you here in person for the actual, the, <laughs> the live events we've got planned. Thank you so much, Natalie. I really appreciate it. And uh, I really hope people get to see a piece of Zanzibar that they haven't seen before. Me too.